As we all know, traveling into space, even on short missions, is a very difficult endeavor. But the complexity increases dramatically when planning for missions that last for months or years at a time. With current predictions of crewed travel to Mars lasting at least three years, NASA researchers must find a way to prepare our astronauts for long missions. To help us understand some of the challenges future astronauts will face, Tonya St. Romain spoke with Orlando Figueroa at NASA headquarters to find out more. Since the early 1960s, the general public has accepted space travel as almost commonplace. Moon missions, shuttle flights, and trips to the International Space Station have helped us learn about the challenges of traveling into space. But with new exploration missions to Mars and beyond, different and possibly even more challenging problems will need to be overcome. Just the journey to Mars will require a new way of thinking about space flight. New vehicles need to be developed, and the crew's physiological concerns such as Radiation exposure, bone loss, and food storage need to be addressed before the mission can be undertaken. To help find out more about some of these challenges, I spoke with Orlando Figueroa at NASA headquarters. Some of the uh, major challenges in getting crews, uh, human beings to another world, deal with the, uh, the environment of space. I mean, not only is it very difficult to get them on their way to the uh, new world, but the radiation environment that they're going to be exposed to, the duration of those flights, other than the moon, most uh, destinations in the solar system are pretty far away, so they're going to spend uh, several months in, in the process. Uh, they also need to carry a significant amount of uh, resources, water, uh, food, to be able to, uh, to live in space, and they're in confined spaces where they need to exercise and to keep their uh, body healthy. We on Earth have to be able to uh, keep track of their health, you know, how are they doing, what happens if they get sick. So an enormous number of challenges that we have to overcome before we're ready to take that, uh, that step. Orlando, give me an idea of what the proposed spacecraft might look like. The proposed spacecraft to uh, take the humans in their journey through uh, space are just uh, as we speak being designed. Uh, they're called crew exploration vehicles. Vehicles designed to be able to carry uh, on board a, uh, a number of astronauts. Uh, and uh, have all of the equipment necessary, the food and uh, other equipment, to, uh, for them to be able to, to go on their journey. Now, uh, they are in similar in shape, perhaps, to some that we observed during the Apollo era. Bigger, much greater capability, and new rockets that are being developed to uh, take them uh, into space. Once in space, the system they're going to be using for propulsion will rely upon chemical, a uh, combination of nuclear, uh, energy, and or chemical this type of technologies that are being developed uh, as we speak. Using current rocket technology, it would take at least six months to get to Mars. In order to cut back on that time, NASA researchers are looking at new methods of propulsion that would greatly reduce trip duration. One of the most promising plans, called Project Prometheus, could cut this travel time to about two months. A Prometheus spacecraft would use nuclear propulsion rather than chemical propulsion to increase speeds to distant worlds. The nuclear option would make a crewed Mars mission much easier because it would reduce the need to carry so much food, fuel, and oxygen. Nuclear power would also mean that Martian launch windows would be longer, allowing a more flexible choice of launch and return times, leading to a crewed landing mission that could last as little as three or four months, as opposed to the current projection of about three years. Another concern is the crew's exposure to radiation when they're in space. So how will the vehicle protect them from the radiation that's in space? Well, space has a certain level of radiation that can get uh, significantly worse if they are exposed to uh, solar emissions. You, know, you have a, a solar uh, ejection. These are highly charged particles that are traveling incredibly fast uh, through space. On Earth, we have the benefit of having a magnificent uh, magnetic field that provides great protection against that, that radiation, those particles. In space, you're fully exposed. So clearly, we need to worry about the design of a spacecraft and, and make certain that it provides a certain amount of shielding or a combination of materials that can increase uh, the, the stoppage ability on those particles. It cannot be 100% effective, so you also need a way to predict when such a, a coronal mass ejections uh, may come through to give them some adequate warning and perhaps have the astronauts move to a safer area in the spacecraft to protect themselves. So it's a combination of systems and prediction and other capabilities that, that would make it uh, much safer. 
Will being in microgravity for long periods of time be detrimental to the astronauts? In space, there is no gravity, of course, or very limited gravity. So you, your bones are not needed for the same purpose or for the same strength that you would need them here on Earth. Likewise, your muscles. You don't need to exert as much pressure or, or force in order to move around. You're not fighting gravity. So therefore, you also tend to lose muscle mass. So one, and, but obviously, once you get to, to the destination, you're going to need that, again, not necessarily if it's to Mars, it's about half of the gravity of Earth, so you wouldn't need as much. Nevertheless, you need you know, a certain amount of uh, strength and muscle mass to be able to move around and be healthy. So part of a, a challenge is to define uh, techniques, skills, equipment, etc., that allow the astronauts to remain healthy and to protect their uh, bone and muscle uh, mass. Uh, to do the journey and return back to Earth, because we have to worry about bringing them back uh, when they're done. A strong element of a vision for space exploration is this combination of humans and machines working together. Uh, to learn about a new world, normally we begin the process by sending robots that, that explore and understand the environment from a science perspective as well as from a uh, engineering and safety perspective. Where would humans I go to do further scientific research and explore this new world. Now, it is a daunting task right now for us to develop all the capabilities that will take us there. And because of that, we're taking a stepwise approach. We're going first to the moon, where we're gonna bring capabilities, develop technologies, develop the knowledge and, and the uh, necessary for humans to survive in that environment for a long period of time. And from there, then start graduating, if you will, to Mars as the next target, the next target where we can start proving the scientific theories and explore this new world, and then move on uh, beyond. That's what the uh, vision for space exploration is all about. We at NASA are incredibly excited about the opportunities that the vision for space exploration are bringing uh, forth. And who knows what we may discover, uh, who knows what we may learn. Coming up, We'll find out what some of the challenges will be for actually living and working on other worlds. But first, did you know that the early days of flight had its share of challenges as well? For example, on May 14, 1918, the U.S. Post Office released the first stamps commemorating airmail delivery, which were scheduled to begin the next day. Unfortunately, the plane pictured on the stamp, the J-4 Jenny, was mistakenly printed upside down. During the inaugural flight, Airman George Boyle had problems from the start eventually crashing his Jenny into a Maryland cornfield. Scrambling from his plane, he stood looking at it, lying upside down, exactly as the inverted stamps had predicted. 